Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Great art, particularly movies at their best, reflect the times in which they were created. In 1968, political assassination paralyzed the nation. A year later, in 1969, we continued to be mired in Vietnam. New York City was in decay and getting worse. The Stonewall riots had energized gay America. Generational warfare and race riots were the norm. Woodstock reshaped and energized music. And Richard Nixon was a year into his presidency. Is it any wonder that the most important film of that year would be a dark, bleak film that pushed the limits of sexuality on screen and would go on to be the first X-rated film to win an Academy Award? The film was Midnight Cowboy. And my guest, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Glenn Frankel, delves deep into the film and what it says about our times in his new book, Shooting Midnight Cowboy. Glenn Frankel is a journalist, author, and motion picture film scholar. His two previous books explored the makings of The Searchers and High Noon. And his new book is Shooting Midnight Cowboy, Art, Sex, Loneliness, Liberation, and the Making of a Dark Classic. Glenn Frankel, welcome back to the program. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you here. I think before we talk about the film, it's important to talk about the context, the time that this film took place, and and what the mood of the country was like at the time. Well, I think you summed it up very well. It was a time of high anxiety. I mean, we'd been through the political assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. Uh, This movie was filmed. The filming of the movie was in 68, even though it didn't come out till May of 69. So they were in that climate. They were in New York City at Columbia University, where I was a freshman, was uh, blowing up that spring. Uh, The buildings, classroom buildings were occupied. The police came in the middle of the night and beat up the protesters. I mean, it was just a raw, difficult time. We we know today we're in an era of, of difficulty, of turbulence, of real divisions in the country. But the late 60s were in many ways even worse. Bombs were going off. I mean, the, the, this group, the Weather Underground and some of their allies had turned from, you know, nonviolent protest uh, to actually, you know, exploding things. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in focusing on Midnight Cowboy, the movie, um, I knew the era because I'd grown up in the era. But nonetheless, it really was a touchstone moment and and a crisis moment. And that gave my book and my research both uh, sort of breathtaking scope that I had to look at, you know, because I had to cover a lot of ground, but at the same time really provided the context to explore both the era and the movie. It's interesting when one looks at movies in in, in particular times that that either they lean into the times, as Midnight Cowboy does, in in its darkness, or they run counter to the times and try and counter-program to reality. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that, though. I have to say, I think any good movie tells you something about the times it was made in, about the values, about what people felt was important. Uh, Molly Haskell, who's a great film critic and wrote a wonderful book about women in movies, says, you know, that that movies are one of the best looking glasses to go back and explore a time in history. They tell you so much. I mean, you can read history books. You can go look at old newspapers. There are a lot of ways. But a movie has a very special uh, glass. And even when it's, uh, as you as you point out, you know, running away from it, trying to take our mind off our, tr- our troubles or whatever they're doing, even when they're clinking champagne glasses during the middle of the Great Depression, you still learn something about the era and the sensibility and what drove audiences to go to the movies. So I... I I just kind of stumbled on this little subgenre of books that are about a movie, but also about the history uh, behind the movie. And, and I, I, I find them, you know, really revealing. The movie tells a lot about the, the, the era, and the era tells you something about the movie. And yet it was very difficult, to say the least, for this movie to get made. There were most uh, studios and studio executives wouldn't touch it. That's right. I mean, the the studio business was changing in the in the mid to late 60s. Audiences had been declining for a while and the audiences were also getting younger. And the old genres, uh the western which I happen to love, uh you know, musicals, biblical epics, all that kind of stuff, uh, sort of lightweight uh romantic comedies, all that stuff was really not attracting uh, the younger audience, which was beginning to take over the demographics of movie going. 
So the studios were looking for things, but that didn't mean they wanted to go too far out there. And Midnight Cowboy is a very out there movie. It's about two social outcasts in New York. One is a young uh, guy from Texas uh, who comes to New York on a Greyhound bus, thinking handsome guy, and he's thinking he's going to make a, a living as you know as a male hustler, hustling uh, middle-aged women, affluent women. Uh, that business model doesn't work at all, but it gets him in all kinds of trouble. It's a very adult-themed movie. It's a very bleak movie in many ways. As you pointed out, New York City, after being sort of the capital of the universe after World War II, is in a state of decline, economic decline, political violence, all kinds of things in New York uh, that I can recall as a teenager that were so difficult. This was not a movie that the major studios wanted to have anything to do with. MGM said it was interested at first, but it had the brilliant idea of maybe casting Elvis Presley as Joe Buck, that Texas guy, and giving him some songs to sing. Uh, and so John Flesinger, the British director who was the driving force behind the movie and really wanted to make the movie, just couldn't believe some of the ideas they had. He was lucky, though. In the end, he found a little the sort of anti-studio, United Artists, which was a small outfit actually based mostly in New York. Um, they didn't have a big studio to pay for. They didn't have a lot of stars under contract, but they were interested in taking chances, and they would take risks on movies with directors who they trusted and liked. And they gave Schlesinger a very minimal budget and said, sure, you can make this little movie. We won't give you very much money, but we'll help you however we can. And Good luck to you. It was interesting that, I mean, first of all, it was the first American movie that Schlesinger would make. And also, he went into this movie coming off a, of a failed movie. Yeah, Schlesinger is a very interesting guy. I mean, my, uh, I was very fortunate with this book to run into just some fascinating people. And, and Schlesinger is a guy who comes through the BBC television documentary uh, unit. Uh, he's used to making small black and white movies. He has some real success in the UK, first with Billy Liar, uh, a sort of serial comedy, and then with Darling, which was a very sort of uh, sexy, entertaining, nasty movie about swinging London and starring Julie Christie, who was in her first major role, and she was so good in it, she won the Academy Award for Best uh, Female Performance in 1965. I mean, uh, so Schlesinger was the hot thing. You know, uh, folks in the U.S. really liked uh, British actors and British filmmakers when they could get them going on things. And um, But then, it, so MGM then sponsors him to make Far From the Madding Crowd, this sort of historical, epic, three-hour, you know, movie of the Thomas Hardy novel. And that just flops. Uh, it's slow. Schlesinger really, it isn't really what the kind of thing that he, he had his heart in it, but he didn't really know how to do it. And Julie Christie, who's so wonderful and darling, is kind of flat in it. So he comes to the States thinking, you know, this, that this new epic is going to do really well, and it bombs. And he's left on his own, and they're warning him, you've got to be careful, John, what you decide to do next. But he's a, he's a singular person. He knows what he wants, and he sticks to it. And what he wants to do is this little bleak novel, Midnight Cowboy. And um, he finds a producer in New York named Jerry Hellman, uh, who's an independent producer and a, you know, a guy who really wants to work with Schlesinger. Jerry knows to take it to United Artists, and they really want to work with Schlesinger. So off they are. What's interesting is that Schlesinger and Hellman were both coming off flops going into this movie. So there was a lot riding on it. And yet Dustin Hoffman, who was a part of it from pretty early on, was coming off a huge hit in The Graduate. Yeah, I mean, Hoffman was first interested in this movie before he even went out to Hollywood to film The Graduate. Uh, but Hoffman is, a, you know, a very interesting figure here. He's one of these guys who's been trained in New York. He thinks he's going to be a theatrical actor, and he's great on stage, though it takes him many years to get roles. I mean, he's five foot six. He's Jewish uh, in identity and the way he looks. He's dark. He's not your typical leading man. And remember, we're just still in the era where, you know, these blonde, beautiful guys like Robert Redford, who also happens to be a superb actor, but that's another story. You know, they're still getting the, the movies. 
And Hoffman has no expectation he's ever going to be anything in the movies. And then Mike Nichols, the great director, comes along and looks at this guy and somehow sees in him uh, the right character to be the lead of The Graduate. And The Graduate uh, comes out in 1966. Uh, seven, late 67, and to everyone's surprise, it becomes a huge hit. And more than that, so Hoffman not only becomes suddenly a celebrity movie star, he's sort of a counterculture icon because The Graduate is like a generation gap movie. I remember seeing it and thinking, wow, I mean, this was a movie that made fun of your parents and it made fun of, you know, bourgeois America. Uh, and so Hoffman becomes this, this icon. Uh, and yet at the same time, remember, he comes from New York. He wants to show his ability as a character actor. He doesn't just want to be a star. He likes making money. He likes all of that. But at the same time, he's got this angst about it, typically so, I, I would say. And so he really wants to do Midnight Cowboy, even though he's not really the lead. You know, he's not going to be the lead guy. It's, it's Midnight Cowboy. It's Joe Buck, the Texas guy. Not Dustin Hoffman, who's playing uh, a down and out sort of, you know, con man, homeless con man called Ratso Rizzo. Nonetheless, Hoffman really w wants to do it, lobbies Schlesinger to get the part, and then does a, a beautiful job of, of researching the role and preparing for it. And, and he's, he's terrific in it. And it's one of the reasons why the movie is still so much fun to see. One of the things that's so surprising, and you write a lot about this in, in, in Shooting Midnight Cowboy, is that John Voight in this role is almost an accident. I mean, he almost doesn't get the role. Well, Voight is another guy who comes along through the New York you know, theater circuit. He's a tall, handsome guy. Uh, and, and very dedicated to his craft, but he too is not really expecting to become a movie star to any extent. He hears about Midnight Cowboy early on, and he thinks, I can do this. He's a very, you know, I, I talked to Voight uh, for several hours, you know, and looking back on it, he was a very sort of self-confident guy, very intense. Uh, he really liked this role. He really thought he could bring something to it. He understood that the Joe Buck character was both incredibly naive and yet, uh, you know, committed and, and, and that he had a sort of little streak of violence in his personality that might come out under stress. And so Voight, Voight really got the character. The problem is that John Schlesinger didn't want him. He didn't think that he looked like the Midnight Cowboy. John really wanted a guy named Michael Sarazen, a French-Canadian actor who was getting parts in movies, very handsome, tall, dark-haired guy. And, uh, and in fact, they offered Sarazen the movie, but Sarazen was signed to another studio which wanted you know, serious money to let him go. Uh, so Schlesinger and Jerry Hellman kept looking at the, uh, you know, uh, at the auditions these guys had filmed, and they said each time they looked at it, Sarazen looked a little worse, and, and Voight looked a little better, <laughs> and eventually they go to Voight, uh, and, uh, you know, we look at the movie now, and the tall, blonde uh, Joe Buck and the short, you know, ethnic Ratzel Rizzo, Hoffman and Voight seem the perfect matches for those characters. It's like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. But at the time, Schlesinger really didn't want either of them. He's just, but he admitted, almost admit, as soon as they started filming, that he was incredibly lucky to get them both. Talk a little bit about the realization of pushing boundaries, both sexual boundaries, content boundaries, and, and how the filmmakers dealt with that all along. Well, again, we're in the late 60s, so besides all the political anxieties and, and tensions and trouble out there, there's a sort of cultural revolution going on. Um, this, you know, a sexual revolution that begins, I guess, with the birth control pill in the early 60s, but inevitably expands into the arts. And movies have been working under a censorship system that doesn't allow for uh, adult themes. But as I mentioned earlier, movies, the studios were also realizing that their profits were shrinking and that their old ways of doing business were simply not going to be successful. So suddenly they open up and they're interested uh, in more adult themes. They're interested in attracting younger audiences. But Midnight Cowboy was a, a difficult sell because, you know, it's about male prostitution. When Joe Buck finds out that his business model of, uh, you know, of servicing women is not working, he ends up in Times Square and he ends up uh, servicing gay 
men, lonely gay men who were roaming around the area looking for people like him. And so this is kind of a bleak theme. All of the sex in both the uh, novel and in the movie is transactional. It's there's no romance. Um, it's cold and it's and it's a bit predatory. And New York is is a predatory place. And this is sort of so. This is a different story told a different way. Schlesinger had no intention of compromising on any of this. Uh, he wasn't out to make Joe Buck into a sweet, nice guy. Uh, throughout the movie, he, he, he captures his naivete, but he also captures his um, predilection for violence when pushed when he's pushed to the wall. Um, he, and so this makes it a very adult movie. Uh, and they 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 every time someone tries to suggest to Schlesinger that he lighten up, he says no. It, this has to be real. The, the redemption of Joe Buck can't be phony, and you know he's not interested in the sort of standard narrative arc of, you know, well the guy learns a lesson and is redeemed. What is redemptive in the movie, however, and what Schlesinger really brought it to him, not so much the adult themes, but the relationship between Joe Buck and Razzo Rizzo. They start out, Razzo is one of the early predators who who basically cons Joe out of 20 bucks. Um, and, and a bunch of New Yorkers con Joe in one way or the other, and eventually he's out on the street with the homeless and with almost no money. But slowly these two guys come to rely on each other. Winter's setting in. New York's a cold, dangerous place. They both need someone to count on, and they're both very isolated, lonely people. New York can be a very lonely place. I, I know that from personal <laughs> experience. And and these guys begin to rely on each other. It's a very wary friendship, though. This isn't a buddy movie, you know, like Robert Redford and Paul Newman and Butch Cassidy, you know, where they love each other and they and they're constantly playing off each other. This this is a much more wary, you know, unhappy uh, partnership that forms very slowly. But nonetheless, when these guys realize that they need each other and, and that and need to, you know, it it creates a bond that's deep enough to carry them through. And that's the beauty of the movie. I mean, I think that's the real reason we still watch Midnight Cowboy is is the bond between these two guys. And, of course, the actors are fabulous in this movie. That's another thing that's very important to note. Worth noting, too, that in the Academy Awards in 1970 that, that Midnight Cowboy won his best picture, but it was up against Butch Cassidy. Yes, it was. And Butch Cassidy is a very entertaining movie. I mean, you know. Uh, and Redford and Newman are, are really quite wonderful in it. I don't mean to any way uh, downplay that. Nonetheless, I mean, Midnight Cowboy is a much more, I would say, serious and authentic movie. I mean, you know, in Butch Cassidy, they stop for a bicycle ride, if you remember, uh, for Paul Newman. And, and Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head is the song that plays out, you know, uh, a song that has uh, a modern song that has nothing to do with the West in the 1880s. Um, where Midnight Cowboy is trying to be, is filmed on the streets of New York. It's much darker and deeper. Uh, the song there is Everybody's Talking, which is a very enigmatic but poignant song that really gets inside the head of Joe Buck and his loneliness and isolation and his search for a home where he feels comfortable. And it's a beautiful song, and Schlesinger uses it several times in the movie. So those kinds of things are going on. Uh, but you're right. When it came to the Oscars, it looked like, you know, that Butch Cassidy would probably run away with Best Picture. Uh, and, and and Midnight Cowboys win was a big surprise. I mean, interesting, too. I mean, the other irony of it at the time is that, that George Roy Hill, who directed Butch Cassidy, used to be partners partnered with Jerry Hellman. Yeah, well, these were New York guys. I mean, one of the things that was going on in the movies now was because, again, the studio were hungry for new stuff and they'd seen Arthur Penn's success with Bonnie and Clyde, Arthur Penn being a New York stage director essentially. And you know, so George Roy Hill becomes starts working in movies after working in New York as well and he's very successful. Uh, Redford, you know, got his start on the stage in New York, and Paul Newman, too. Uh, New York is, is a place that the movies are turning to to get more interesting, innovative stuff. So it's no surprise that Jerry was a New York producer, an independent guy. He hadn't had a lot of success. 
but he knew, uh, you know, he, he wanted to do high quality work. And he went after Schlesinger and insisted, even though Jerry, Jerry was really worried about Midnight Cowboy. I mean, he didn't think this was the greatest thing for a new partnership between him and Schlesinger. But when John wanted to do it, Jerry was smart enough to know that he should stick to the guy and, and try it out. And that's the thing, one of the things about the movie, all these talented people coming together, as you point out, both Jerry and, and Schlesinger had, were coming off flops. They got eventually hooked up with Waldo Salt, a, a, a screenwriter who'd been blacklisted throughout the 1950s, who was an alcoholic, who was a, a guy really you know, on the outs, but a very dedicated writer who really loved the story of Midnight Cowboy. And and did a fabulous screenplay that won Waldo, uh, you know, best adapted screenplay Oscar. So these people come together, Hoffman and Voigt, the supporting cast, which is also fabulous, thanks to Marion Doherty, the, the casting director in New York, who Jerry knew well and who they worked with. Uh, some of these people I'd never heard of before I started working on this book, and yet they are famous in the profession. They were all at the height of their powers when it came to Midnight Cowboy. They were hungry, they were young, and they came to New York to do their craft, do their art, and Midnight Cowboy in many ways was you know, the apex for all of them. You talk about Schlesinger, who didn't want to compromise and really wanted to, to go for it in terms of the content. How did United Artists deal with that as the movie started to take shape? Well, the guy who had green-lighted it at United Artists was a young guy named David Picker. He was the nephew of one of the you know, top executives right. there. Who had just but taken over the studio. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, Picker, you know, he was their young sort of uh, diplomat envoy who they sent out into the younger uh, cultural aspect, you know, parts of the world looking for good movies. And uh, Picker had helped bring them the Beatles movie, a Hard Day's Night, a couple of other things that had made them a lot of money. So they trusted David. And his his philosophy, David passed away last year, but I was lucky enough to interview him by phone before then. And he told me his philosophy was you get a great filmmaker and you let him do what he wants to do. You have to agree on the budget. Uh, once you look at the budget, once you look at the screenplay, that's it. David Picker never, only one night in the whole filming showed up to watch a little bit of it. He never looked at the dailies, you know, the raw footage that came out. He never bugged Schlesinger. His idea was, this guy's going to make me an interesting movie. Now, where they ran into conflicts was over the size of the budget, because Picker originally uh, approved $1.1 million. And he knew, everybody knew that budget would never be enough. Um, but uh, Jerry kept coming back at him with larger and larger sums to the point where it finally hit $3 million. And uh, Jerry, being a smart producer, figured out ways to conceal some of the money that was being spent. They 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 hired Dustin Hoffman, who came, you know, who cost them a lot more money uh, after the graduate. Uh, Picker was worried about that. They almost killed the film a couple of times, but it wasn't over the sex or the violence. It was over the money. What about the senior executives at UA? People like uh, Arthur Cribb and Bob Benjamin when they saw this movie. Well. You know, they saw uh, Picker previewed it for all of them, and he brought in everybody at UA in New York at the time, uh, including the secretaries and I think maybe some of the custodians. <laughs> he, he just had a feeling he wanted to get everybody in the room. And this movie is so powerful that when it was over, they even the top executives were very happy with it. They knew they had something special. They didn't know it would make a lot of money. Uh, but they knew it was a special work. United Artists was about special work. Uh, that was fine. But what troubled them was uh, some of the sex in the movie, and not because it was pornographic. I mean, there's not a real nudity in the movie or anything like that, but because it was so cold and transactional and because there was gay sex that was at least implied or more than implied in the movie. And that troubled especially uh, Seymour Krim, uh, the head of UA. Seymour Krim is a, another fascinating figure, you know, a businessman, a lawyer who takes over United Artists, uh, makes it profitable, lives in New York rather than Hollywood. He's not interested in the old studio ways of doing things. But at the same time, he, he's a fundraiser for the Democratic Party. He's, a, you know, he gives a lot of money to charity. 
Midnight Cowboy makes him nervous. First, he applauds it when he sees it, but then he's worried about the sex, and especially the gay sex. And he consults with a psychiatrist at uh, Columbia University's medical school, um, and they decide that uh, they have to be careful with the movie, and they decide to rate it X. Now, let me just say, the rating system had just come into effect in 1968. Midnight Cowboy was one of the early movies to be rated. Uh, and the ratings board had gave it an R for restricted. They you know, were nervous about the sex a little bit, too, but they thought the movie was of such high quality that it deserved an R rating, and it deserved a chance to be seen by young people you know, as long as it was restricted. Uh, and their parents, say for a 17-year-old, could make the decision. Well, uh, Krim wasn't happy with that, and he self-rated it X. And so there you go. It, it's the only X-rated movie to be nominated to win the Academy Award, the, the first one, obviously, and the only one. And and after and United Artists wasn't comfortable with it. At the same time, though, when they marketed the movie, they took advantage of the X rating to say, uh, whatever you've heard about Midnight Cowboy is true. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a brilliant campaign. It appealed to young people. The idea that the X rating had a certain cachet to it. Now, after it won Best Picture, United Artists went back to the ratings board and asked them to knock it down to an R, which they did with no controversy at all. Uh, but it's it's... It's part of the myth of Midnight Cowboy that it was an X-rated movie that the ratings board rated it X because they were a bunch of prudes, all that kind of thing. <laughs> and, and, and none of that is true. <laughs> but what, is, what it does reflect is the great discomfort over homosexuality in that time. It still was illegal. You know, sodomy was still legalized in something like 49 states. Uh, homophobia was rampant not only in the usual places places where you might find it now, but among liberal media institutions like the New York Times and Harper's Magazine in New York. The psychiatry, you know, community, the priesthood, as I call it in the book, uh, the psychoanalytical priesthood, very Freudian and very had, had its explanation considered homosexuality a disease, you know, uh, you know, and. And was people were deep into conversion therapy. So if it's a disease, then you can you can be cured of it. That means if you're if you're gay and you don't go to be cured of it, you're responsible in some way. And also they feared that homosexuality somehow was contagious. It's like the pandemic, you know, that that it could be passed on. I mean, all these things based on no research, but based on I don't know deep seated prejudices. Um, that begin to peel away in the late 60s and with the Stonewall riots and with gay gays beginning to be depicted in movies and in the theater and in the arts. Things begin to change, but very, very slowly. And Midnight Cowboy is a little before the curve on that. And finally, Glenn, how does the movie hold up today? Well, I think it holds up very well. You know, one of the things about doing these books is you end up watching a movie a lot of times and you always end up, I always end up falling in love with the movie. I, I think some of the, you know, uh, some of the moments and the music and things are a little outdated, but it's a great documentary about what New York looked like in the late sixties. But what gives it its real, I think, um, sensibility that, that we still relate to is fundamentally the relationship between Joe Buck and Ratso Rizzo. And that falls back to Hoffman and Voigt in many ways, who I think give one of the very, very finest collaborative performances, male performances in the history of movies. I just think they're that good. And they bring you the sense of vulnerability of these lonely, isolated outcasts. And, uh, and because Schlesinger never turns away and he never compromises, you, you get it all. You, you, you know, there's no romantic happy ending to this. There's no redemption for Joe Buck. We don't know what's going to happen to him at the end of the movie. We know what he's been through. We know that he's changed. We know that he's trying to connect, make a human connection with other people. And the first human connection he makes is with this other guy. And that is 
a, a great tribute to a pair of actors. I love talking to each of them because I asked them a lot about each other and about working together, and they challenged each other, and they produced something that I think is enduring now, still speaks to us, and you know will endure as long as people are interested in movies. Glenn Frankel, the book is Shooting Midnight Cowboy, Art, Sex, Loneliness, Liberation, and the Making of a Dark Classic. Glenn, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Well, this was great. Thank you so much. Great questions, and, and you know, and I love talking to you about the book. Well, it's fascinating stuff. Thank you so much.